next uh, speaker is uh, Associate Professor Kenneth Sakaris. Uh, he's the Director of Chemical Pathology at Melbourne Pathology Australia and Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology at Melbourne University. Prof Sakaris has been Chair of the RCPA QAP Chemistry and Key Incident Programs and is an examiner for the AACB and the RCPA Faculty of Science. And he has been Chair of the IFCC Committee on Analytical Quality and a member of the IFCC Committee on Reference Intervals and Decision Limits. So he's uh, you know, amazingly experienced and we are so pleased to have him here uh, today uh, to share his uh, thoughts about lipids and lipoprotein testing. Thank you, Prof Professor. Please take it away. Thank you, Ferlene. So um, lipid testing, it's a big part of what laboratories uh, do. Um, now, what I'm going to be focusing on the standard lipid profile, which every lab does, the cholesterol, triglyceride, HDL, and the calculation of LDL. Uh, we do about um, 700,000 of these a year in my laboratory. And so um, I sort of need to say that, you know, I'm going to give you 27 cases uh, today, and I'm not sure they tell you everything you need to know, but it will give you a very good start. So case number one is a, a man who's um, 25 years old. He's diabetic, he's on a statin, and he's on um, insulin. And he's got, um, he's been running along with um, high triglycerides, um, a high -ish cholesterol, a lowish HDL. And then he came in with this profile, uh, cholesterol of 20, triglycerides of 100, um, HDL of 0.24 and the ratio of 86.3. So now this tells us a lot about what is going on. Um, if you look here, the ratio between triglycerides to cholesterol has been about two to one, whereas now it's like five to one. So there's some sort of particle in his blood which is full of triglyceride. So you have to read behind the numbers and imagine what is happening to this patient. And that's where lipidology started with Fredrickson because they looked at the serum and you could expect this chap has a milky serum and probably because of the cholesterol, uh, triglyceride cholesterol ratio, a chylomicrons floating at the top of it. And so Fredrickson, you know, me was measuring cholesterol and triglycerides, and he correlated the measurement of cholesterol and triglycerides with the appearance of serum, and he came up with those different um, categories of uh, uh, of lipidemia. Now we don't really use those anymore, um, but but they do they are an instructive thing to say. You need to think about what's happening in the blood. So in the blood, there are these lipoprotein particles. And so the particles um, can be triglyceride rich, which chylomicrons are. They're usually about 10 to 1 triglycerides to cholesterol. Or they can be um, cholesterol rich. And um, HDL and LDL are you know, 1 to 4 triglyceride to cholesterol. Um, this is the particle, so inside the middle of it, there's triglyceride and cholesterol ester, cholesterol attached to fatty acids. And on the surface, there's um, phospholipids, cholesterol, and the skeleton of the particle is the, the brown, but the lipoproteins, the protein that really gives the um, lipoprotein its structure and its um, recognition. So... This chap had a, a triglyceridemia of 100, which is like extreme. This is called very severe hypertriglyceridemia. And it's distinguished to what he had before, which was moderate hypertriglyceridemia, because, particularly because he's at a severe risk of pancreatitis. So what are the causes of hypertriglyceridemia? The major causes are related to insulin resistance. So metabolic syndrome, treated type 2 diabetes and untreated diabetes. Um, the next most common cause is probably alcohol. And then there are some other, other causes which we'll discuss. So here's another, here's, um, here's that, that patient, we're still on case number one. This is that patient's haemoglobin A1C. And you can see he's got poorly controlled diabetes. 
and um, and so he fits into that category of poorly controlled diabetes, and that's why he's got high triglycerides. And it got worse, and it seems like getting worse really tipped the balance into making things worse. Now, this is the relationship. You won't find this in textbooks, by the way, but this is the relationship between haemoglobin A1c, increasing haemoglobin A1c, and cholesterol, triglyceride, LDL, and HDL. Now, as diabetes gets worse, the total cholesterol level, strangely enough, initially it falls. In, in controlled diabetes, it's lower than it is in healthy people. But then when it gets severe, the cholesterol is high again. And the reasons why it's high, it's because the triglycerides are constantly rising. Now, this is a log scale. So actually, this triglyceride rise is exponential with worsening diabetes. And so you can see that at this extreme here, when the A1C is over 12, you can often expect triglycerides of up to 10 or 20 easily. Um, anyway, that gives you a little bit of feel for that untreated uh, diabetes mellitus. And he has untreated diabetes mellitus. His fasting glucose was 15. The other thing about him was he had abnormal uh, renal function. So he wasn't, um, and low albumin. And he had frank proteinuria rather than albuminuria. That's a very high albumin creatinine ratio. So he's also got proteinuria. So the poor man's probably also got a diabetic nephropathy with proteinuria, which probably explains why his triglycerides went so high. Now, here's another patient with very high triglycerides, 60 compared to 15. The ratio is 4 to 1. It's not in the range of the usual VLDL. It's in the range of chylomicrons. And, and we've told he's got a past history of, eth of ethanol abuse. And here's his liver function test. You can see the gamma GT, which is the best marker of... Um, Alcoholism is very high and he's got active um, hepatitis. And he doesn't have thyroid disease. Now, we'll touch on this issue about lipids and thyroid disease, but he, anyway, and thyroid disease is nothing to do with it. And he doesn't have um, any diabetes or insulin resistance. He's got pure alcoholism. And proof of that is here is... Uh, and this is a call I often get from doctors. Within a couple of weeks, his cholesterol went from 60 to 1. And people say that's impossible. It's absolutely possible if they stop drinking. And um, and he stopped drinking. I, I, sorry, I didn't show you. I'm not sure whether I'll show you the um, liver function tests improve incredibly over that month as well. Um, this is another cause of hypertriglyceridemia. Um, a few months after this doctor first saw this patient, the triglycerides shot up to 4.5. And they were seeing a dermatologist, and they were on this drug called raocutane. And raocutane's on the list. It's one of the drug-induced hypertriglyceridemia due to this drug, isotrinoin, which is, interferes with triglyceride metabolism in the liver. Um, Here's a patient who's 26 weeks pregnant and they've got high triglycerides and a very high cholesterol. It's not chylomicrons because there's not lots of triglycerides compared to cholesterol, but there's an increase in some particles here. What's going on? Interestingly, the HDL has increased. Now, this is surprising. I'm not sure why you should measure triglycerides in that second or third trimester, but, um, and she didn't have gestational diabetes. This was her glucose tolerance test in the uh, gestation, and, and you can see she didn't have gestational diabetes. Pregnancy can cause high triglycerides. And this is some of our own data that shows how cholesterol and triglycerides change across gestation. So in the second and third trimester, um, 
believe it or not, it's normal to have a cholesterol up to nine millimole per litre, and it can be normal to have a triglyceride up to five or six millimole per litre. So she was she had a normal pregnancy, and and it's a good idea not to measure lipids in pregnancy because it shocks people. Here's a 25 week pregnant woman who's got high triglycerides. Is this pregnancy? Well, just a minute. Isn't the cholesterol supposed to rise rather than fall? And the other thing in pregnancy is that HDL rises because of the estrogen effect. So there's something different about this woman's triglycerides. And it's because she has type 2 diabetes and is pregnant and she's got um, insulin resistance. Now, the A1C is probably not reliable. She's supposed to have type 2 diabetes, but later in pregnancy, the A1C is not as reliable because the mother's starting to make lots of new red cells and that'll drop the A1C. Okay, different woman, 24 years old. She's got hypothyroidism and polycystic ovary syndrome. So she's got high triglycerides, low HDL. So is this to do with her thyroid disease or due to her polycystic ovary syndrome, which is related to insulin resistance? Here is her TSH. So she is mildly hyperthyroid because the TSH is elevated. But is that enough to cause hypertriglyceridemia? So again, another set of graphs you won't see anywhere, um, but I have them in my mind and I'm sharing this information with you. This is what happens. For, for first of all, you've seen these. These are the triglycerides. So triglycerides rise with insulin resistance. So does she have uh, that? Well, her hemoglobin A1C was 6.7. So it probably explains why her triglycerides are elevated. This is a different patient, case seven, 57 year old woman with hypothyroidism. So here she's got a high, tri she's got a high triglyceride, but also very high cholesterol. So is this related to hypothyroidism? Well, here's her thyroid function. She was hypothyroid a few months before, but now if anything, she's over replaced and no longer hypothyroid. So it can't explain her high cholesterol or her high triglyceride. So here, how is TSH and thyroid disease related to lipids? Cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL and HDL. You can see with cholesterol, it doesn't really change much until your TSH is clearly elevated, like well above 10. Um, and triglycerides generally don't change at all with thyroid disease. Anybody who thinks the thyroid disease is a cause of hypertriglyceridemia is probably going to miss the insulin resistance that the patient has. So I think that's an error in most textbooks that say that hypertriglyceridemia is related to hypothyroidism. Hypercholesterolemia is, but not hypertriglyceridemia. And um, this was uh, her, this is her, um, now this is another patient actually, case number eight, who's got a low triglyceride. So has that got anything to do with thyroid? I've told you, trigs don't change in thyroid disease. I don't know why she's got a low trig. And what is, I, the question was, what is a low trig? We don't actually quote a lower limit for triglyceride on our report. If I had to pick a number, it'd be around 0.4, which is unusually low. But what does it mean? Um, some people say low trig is less than 1.7. No, no, that's a healthy trig. It's not a low trig. Um, now, this patient here with low with a, a triglyceride of 0 0.2, well, there's nothing wrong with her thyroid. It's got nothing to do with her thyroid. If you imagine that, well, she's got thyroid disease, that's why her trigs are 0.2, you're kidding yourself. So causes of low trigs. Very rarely, if you can't make ApoB, which is a structural protein for LDL and VLDL, you won't, you'll have very low trigs, well below 0.5, typically 0.2 or so. And because you can't make LDL, 
you'll also have low cholesterol. You know, they're very rare. I, d I don't see them. Pediatric hospitals see them. Most of them are diagnosed in adulthood, actually, with steatorrhea. Um, other causes, not hyperthyroidism. Uh, malabsorption can because you're not absorbing nutrients, let alone triglycerides. Anorexia does. And, and, and extremes of nutrition also can cause low trig. But strangely enough, low-fat diets do not cause low trigs. What causes low trigs are high-fat diets. So here's a patient, just to prove this issue regarding hyperthyroidism. Um, this, is, this was the same patient as case 8. And here, when she was hyperthyroid, she had a higher trig. A point, rather than 0.2, it was 0.5. Here's a different patient, 48-year-old, who's feeling weak and about to faint because she's developed florid thyrotoxicosis. Well, if anyone's going to get low trigs from thyrotoxicosis, she would. And what was her trig? 1.1. Uh, so forget about trigs and thyroid disease. It's all about cholesterol in severe hypothyroidism and in severe hypothyroidism. Remembering, trigs don't change in thyroid disease, but uh, trigs can fall in hyperthyroidism and trigs can rise in severe hypothyroidism. Um, now, this is a 31-year-old woman with anorexia nervosa. Um, she's got low trigs and low cholesterol. That's a, a nutrition issue. He's a man on a high-fat diet. He went onto a high-fat diet between those two dates. And what happened to his results on his high-fat diet? The cholesterol rose, the triglycerides fell, and the HDL rose. And this is what should happen on a high-fat diet. Um, there's a study you know, done with hundreds of thousands of people off 18 countries, and they looked at the intake of saturated fat and yes, it's true. Saturated fats increase cholesterol and increase LDL. Um, but they increase HDL and decrease triglycerides. And the net effect on this predictor, total cholesterol HDL ratio, is that your risk actually falls on a high fat diet. Whereas a high carb diet, a high sugar diet, yes, a high carb diet will drop your cholesterol. It will drop your LDL, but it will also drop your HDL and increase your triglycerides. And the net effect on your risk markers will be a worsening of risk. So in the pure study, they looked at the, the percentage of energy derived from saturated fats. And if you can increase your saturated fats intake to at least 10%, your risk of cardiovascular disease falls. Conversely, if you increase your carbohydrate intake above 50 or 60%, your risk of cardiovascular disease rises. Now, I have to declare a conflict of interest there. Some, I don't know whether many of you know this, that um, I've got quite a few YouTubes on uh, that have been viewed quite a few times, uh, each of them, and they're from this low carb down under. So I really do think um, the world is changing. You can see all the no sugar soft drinks and low carb meals and everything. People are starting to realise that the harm comes from sugar and high carb diets and saturated fats are actually quite safe. And uh, the, I was... a uh, cartoon character in this sugar film, which was um, seen in many countries in the world. Okay, so what about, we've done triglycerides, we've spent probably more than enough time on them. So what about high cholesterol? Um, a cholesterol, this patient, um, family history of heart disease, only 34 years old, he's got a cholesterol of 10 and a triglyceride of two. The cholesterol HDL ratio is poor. That's not good. So what is this? Well, the whole link between cholesterol and cardiovascular disease started with uh, Nikolai Anichkow, a Russian who fed cholesterol to rabbits, which is a very abnormal thing to do because rabbits are herbivores. 
cholesterols in animal products. So, you know, anyway, but what he noticed if you feed cholesterol to rabbits is they develop atheroma, that cholesterol accumulates in plaque. So that was the first understanding that maybe cholesterol's got something to do with atherosclerosis. Interestingly, um, Nicolay also did the study with guinea pigs and they got plaque, but rats didn't get plaque, no matter how much cholesterol you fed them. And so he actually concluded, therefore, we don't really know whether you feed cholesterol to humans, whether it causes um, atherosclerosis. But nevertheless, for the last 50 or 60 years, people have been worried about eating eggs. And to be honest, they have a marginal increase in cholesterol and there's no evidence that eggs uh, cause heart disease. So this chap with the cholesterol of 10 and the family history, in the 1930s, we, we recognised this disease of familial hypercholesterolemia, people who naturally had high cholesterol levels. And yes, they do get plaque, atherosclerosis, and they get cholesterol accumulating in their skin and tendons and eyes. Sorry, can you mute, mute whoever you are? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, and the next stage in this was in the 1948, a, a man called Jeff Goffman used an ultra centrifuge to work out where is the cholesterol in blood. And he worked out that it, it, it resided at different densities. There were particles with different densities. By the way, the ultra centrifuge in the 1940s was in America, they developed ultra centrifuge technology because they were trying to separate uranium for the atom bomb in the 40s. So anyway, fortunately, there was a better use for ultra centrifuges than uranium. And, um, and those particles were the chylomicrons, the very uh, buoyant particles and the very high density particles of HDL. So we discovered these particles and the chylomicrons were triglyceride rich and the uh, HDL and LDL are cholesterol rich, as I showed before. So what are these particles? In the endogenous system of the liver, the liver makes VLDL. It's the way the liver transport triglycerides to the tissues. And then um, the lipoprotein lipase takes up the triglyceride. And as you empty VLDL of triglyceride, it becomes less buoyant or more dense and becomes intermediate, intermediate density lipoprotein. That particle can go back to the liver or it can continue giving up triglyceride and become more dense. And then it can go back via the ApoB receptor to the liver with the LDL receptor. So these particles are part of normal metabolism. LDL is part of normal metabolism. It's not a pathogenic particle. Um, Brown and Goldstein uh, discovered the LDL receptor, uh, that one that I mentioned before. They got their Nobel Prize not because they understood familial hypercholesterolemia, because they, they were the first to discover receptor-mediated endocytosis. So what happens in the in fibroblasts, they describe, but this is what happens in the hepatocyte as well. The LDL binds to the receptor, it's internalized, and then when it's broken down, the message that there's lots of cholesterol around switches off cholesterol production in the cell. It doesn't need to make cholesterol, there's plenty coming back via LDL. And um and it also impacts cholesterol esterification and LDL receptors. So that's why they discovered that if your, re if your receptors don't work, then there won't be any internalization of the LDL and you'll have uncontrolled increases in HMG-CoA reductions, which is cholesterol metabolism. So, so the lack, the, a poorly functioning receptor means the cell just overproduces cholesterol. And here's the, um, from their papers as well, you know, so normally um, if you increase LDL, there's more binding. If you increase LDL, there's more internalization. If you increase LDL, the cholesterol synthesis switches off. But in people with defective receptors, there's no receptors, 
binding. There's no internalization. There's no production of, L of ELDL, and there's no cholesterol. Uh, the, there's no switching off of cholesterol synthesis. It goes on unbridled. So just a closer look at that receptor because there's more things that can go wrong with it than just the receptors wrong. So the receptor, the LDL receptor is a protein um, that uh, receives the LDL particle. It's recognized by ApoB. It's actually ApoB that the LDL, LDL receptor recognizes. So you could have a fault with the LDL receptor that would cause familial hypercholesterolemia, or you could have a fault in ApoB, defective ApoB, and that can cause familial hypercholesterolemia as well. And then finally, um, there's a protein which is a regulatory protein for um, LDL um, uptake, and it's uh, called PCSK9. Now, um, all of those faults mean that LDL won't be taken up and it'll float around in the blood longer than it should. Normally, LDL disappears from the blood within one or two weeks. But if you've got defective receptors, it'll hang around for even longer, twice as long, let's say. So the long dwell time of LDL and the increased production of cholesterol is what characterizes um, familiar hypercholesterolemia. So if there's no uptake of LDL, it stays in the circulation and it can give up triglycerides to the tissue and not um, and LDL2 can be taken up to the lesser degree. But there's a protein also called um, cholesterol ester transfer protein. And it um, exchanges a triglyceride out of these particles in exchange for cholesterol ester. So it takes triglyceride out of the LDL and puts in cholesterol ester. And that just accelerates this shrinking and, more, and increased density of the LDL particle. So if you don't take up LDL, it'll not only dwell there for a long time, but it will become small and dense. And small dense LDL can't get back to the liver. It's too abnormal. And it goes to the scavenger receptor of the macrophages. Um, we also know if this is modified in other ways, oxidized or glycated, it, it will even be even you know more attractive food for a macrophage. And the macrophages are important because that's what happens in plaque. The macrophages take up lipid and cause foam cell formation and plaque. So what is it that causes atherosclerosis? Is it LDL, which is completely natural, large buoyant LDL? No, increased levels of large buoyant LDL do not cause increased cardiovascular disease. What causes cardiovascular disease is increasing concentrations of small dense LDL. And so in familial hypercholesterolemia, here with defective ApoB, the particle which predominates is not buoyant LDL, but small dense LDL, because it's long dwell time means it becomes small and dense. Now, we know that statins improve survival in familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, so, you know, you, you better be on a statin if, you're on, if you've got FH um, and you don't have some other way of treating it. But what they do, they lower small dense LDL. They're not lowering LDL, they're particularly lowering small dense LDL. Now here's a 34 year old woman, she's got a family history of heart disease. Her cholesterol's 6.9, doesn't seem to be too high. Her LDL is 5.2, which we've flagged as high. And in our laboratory, we put a comment on her to say, you need to consider familial hypercholesterolemia because her LDL is above five. And you need to calculate her likelihood of FH, I'll come to that, and consider genetic testing. So what about, so she's got a family history and she's got a raised LDL, what, what's her likelihood? Well, generally people use the Dutch Lipid Clinic scoring system, and it gives you uh, points if you've got family history, if you've got clinical history, if you've got physical evidence of cholesterol in your skin or your eye, um, and depending on how high your LDL is. Now, she scores one for family history and five for her LDL level, 
which is a six, and six mean she's probably got familial hypercholesterolemia. Until proven otherwise, she may have it. And so she deserves to be followed up. Here's another patient, um, familial hypercholesterolemia, cholesterol 13.8. Um, she is 59 years old, um, not having much success on statins. And um, and I, won't, I probably won't cover this, but she's on a new therapy which is aimed against PCSK9 rather than a statin. So PCSK9 inhibitors, why, why, why are we interested in PCSK9 at all? As I mentioned before, how does it have a role in cholesterol metabolism? Well, PCSK9 is made in the hepatocyte and um, it's processed and then it's um, when it's mature, it can be um, exported and you can find it in the circulation as well as inside the cell. Now, PCSK9 can attach to the LDL receptor and LDL and when it does that, it leads to the internalization of the receptor with PCSK9 tag and then what happens is that the whole particle is destroyed. So you end up destroying your LDL receptor. So patients with high PCSK9 lose their LDLs or receptors. So if we block um, a PCSK9 with an antibody like um, that drug, then um, you will increase the number of LDL receptors available for any particular patient. Um, Anyway, so let's uh, move on. Here's another patient, probably got familial hypercholesterolemia, really high. Um, so what, now things to seem to be improving, but you know, the ratio is still bad. Um, now I'm gonna introduce you to something which uh, we do in Australia, which I'm not sure of any um, places do it, which is called LDL typing or, or LDL electrophoresis. It's done by uh, gradient gel electrophoresis. And uh, what it can do is separate all the particles in a gel. And so it can look at VLDL, the different forms of IDL, the different forms of LDL, large buoyant LDL, which is good, and small dense LDL, which is bad. This is a good pattern because there's no small dense LDL. This is a bad pattern because they've got small dense LDL. And you'll also notice in the pattern they happen to have high levels of VLDL or high triglyceride and a lower level of HDL. Anyway, this is a type B pattern because of the presence of small dense LDL. So um, what predicts the presence of small dense LDL. Now, in the early 90s, uh, Ron Krauss and his crew in California found that triglycerides predicted. So if you've got high triglycerides, if your triglycerides are below one, you probably phenotype A, no small dense LDL. Whereas the higher your triglycerides are about above one or above 1 1.5, your odds on you've got small dense LDL. And so in the 1990s, I really knew that 1.5 is the point you don't want to be above as a triglyceride. Now, triglycerides are available, but are there better markers than triglycerides in predicting the presence of small dense LDL, the atherogenic particle? And we did a study of a few um, thousand um, LDL profiles, and we found that triglycerides were pretty good at predicting, this is a Spearman rank correlation, but there were better markers of small dense LDL. It was non-HDL, LDL-HDL ratio, and total cholesterol HDL ratio, which we found was the best ratio. So it's not surprising that we don't use any of these parameters to predict risk. We are only using these parameters. Why? because they are related to the pathogenic mechanism of atherosclerosis, which is small dense LDL. The LDL-HDL uh, ratio was known to be more predictive than cholesterol on its own or HDL on its own in 1988. But, you know, that led to this uh, myth of, well, HDL's protective. No, that ratio predict it doesn't, it's got nothing to do with HDL. 
It's just got to do with that ratio predicts the presence of small dense LDL. And that's why in Australia, we use the total cholesterol HDL ratio. Again, even though people don't fully realize it, it's not because it's got anything to do with HDL. It's because it predicts small dense LDL. Now, before I get too um, passionate about total cholesterol HDL ratio, the ratio that works best varies according to disease state and gender. Total cholesterol HDL ratio works best in everything, but if you've got non-diabetic women, triglycerides are the, high, the most predictive ratio. If you've got um, and and non-HDL is uh, you know pretty good in now non-HDL is pretty good. So head to head, total cholesterol HDL ratio or non-HDL. It sort of varies by study to study which one's best. But overall, um, I like um, total cholesterol HDL ratio. So what about that chap who's got the cholesterol of 20 and the cholesterol of 12? What about if we did his, protein, his lipoprotein electrophoresis, what would it show? Well, here's what it showed when his cholesterol is 20 and 12. Lots of small dense LDL. Now, even though his total cholesterol HDL ratio improved from 12 to 6, it was still bad. And so she's still got small dense LDL. Um, this is a woman who's um, got a total cholesterol HDL ratio of 2. Her cholesterol's 8, but her ratio's 2 because she's got such a good HDL. Be very interesting to know what sort of LDL she has, wouldn't it? Well, this is her profile. She's got no small dense LDL. There are some patients with high cholesterol and high HDL. I mean, remember, she also had a very low triglyceride level. I'm pretty sure she was uh, from one of the doctors who treats with high fat diets in Australia. Anyway, so uh, what about um, this 61-year-old man? Cholesterol of six, trig of... Cholesterol's not that high. It's only mildly elevated. The ratio's pretty poor. What, what particles would he have? Ratios. Look at the cholesterol HDL ratio, 10. What about this ratio? What about this one? Here was his um, profile just full of LDL, three, four, five, six, and seven. It's very rare to get the tiniest LDL. So that's a disastrous profile. That's why he's got coronary artery calcification. Now, for him, it wasn't because he had a high cholesterol. For him, it was because he has high triglyceride. So the other way of getting this long dwell time and the production of small dense LDL is not by messing up your receptor, but by having high concentrations of LDL, of, sorry, of triglyceride. And that will drive the formation of small dense LDL. We know, we've known for 50 years um, that um, LDL disappears slowly from the circulation of diabetic patients because they have high triglyceride. LDL also disappears slowly from the circulation of patients with chronic renal failure. I wonder why that is. Um, we actually did some studies on uh, renal failures, and the, the reason why is because renal patients have insulin resistance as well and high triglycerides. So the worse your resistance or your sensitivity is lower, um, the lower, the smaller the diameter of your LDL particle. Okay, 20-year-old man, cholesterol HDL ratio of seven. Cholesterol's not that high. The triggers are high. For a 20-year-old man, they're bad. HDL's 0.7. The ratio is 7.7. .7. No wonder he had a CVA. He had a stroke. This is his profile. Most of his LDL is in the small dense form. 
This is a recent study, 2021. What predicts ischemic stroke? Increasing concentrations of triglyceride. Non-Alzheimer's dementia is also predicted by increasing concentration of triglyceride, much more than cholesterol. Alzheimer's is not predicted by triglyceride. That's a different mechanism. Okay, um, what about this woman here? She's got familial hypercholesterolemia. Cholesterol's not that bad, and her ratio is not that bad. And she's fairly thin for her height, and both brothers have had a bypass. What the hell's going on with this family? What is LPA? because she's got a very high level. And this is the cause of their family problems. Any family where the cholesterol doesn't explain their high risk, you must measure this protein, this protein or lipoprotein. LP little a is um, lipoprotein little a, and it's got, um, it's this protein, apo little a, attached to the LDL particle, and it makes it atherogenic. Increasing levels of LP delay, increasing risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, this man, 48 years old, um, LP delay really high. Everything else looks pretty good. He's been put on a statin, everything looks good. Um, his LDL profile is not too bad, but this is invalid. Because here we're measuring size. And guess what? LP delay is big LDL. So we can't see LP delay in this profile. Unless you measure it, you don't know what's there. Um, LP delay you know, is very hard to treat. No matter if you give them a statin, you give them a fibrate, it's hard to you give them both of them together. You don't shift the LP delay. It's very hard to treat. Um, here's a, a patient who's got. Um, Previous stroke, um, high cholesterol, high triglyceride, low HDL, LP little a is bad, hemoglobin A1C is high. Now he's got LP little a and he's got small dense LDL. That's terrible. That's why he's got such a terrible cardiovascular disease. He's got a double whammy. He's got LP little, L, apo little a making his LDL atherogenic and he's got the um, triglycerides making his LDL small. Uh, incidentally, Nikolai, people who did the same experiment as Nikolai and gave uh, cholesterol to uh, rabbits, and guess what? You make small dense LDL. Um, 44 year old man, cholesterol's low. Triggs are very high. HDL is very, very low. What, what causes such a low HDL? You can confirm whether a HDL is low by measuring the lipoprotein, the, apo, the apolipoprotein, the protein content of HDL, and it's ApoA1, and it was low. So we've confirmed that HDL is real. And he's always had a low HDL. So what, what does that? Well, these are the cause of low HDL. He's got hypoalpha lipoproteinemia or tangier disease. And it's very easy to recognize because you just have to look in their mouth and see the yellow or orange tonsils. Other than that, low HDL is due to hypertriglyceridemia and also due to anabolic steroids. This was a 21-year-old man who you've already seen um, this in the fertility lecture. He's got a low HDL. Does he have Tangier's disease? A terrible risk, according to this. Here was his SHBG. Now, S, the only thing that causes such a low SHBG is anabolic steroids. And the anabolic steroids have suppressed his gonadotrophins. So, so this was it. So, you know, he needs to stop the anabolic steroids. And when he stopped his anabolic steroids, guess what? Gradually, his HDLs went back up. So it wasn't Tangier's disease. Um, we covered low HDL. What about high HDL? What can cause a high HDL? Um, 
some people genetically have a high HDL, and it's not necessarily a good thing to have. Um, other causes, alcoholism, primary biliary cirrhosis, hyperthyroidism, and drugs. Um, now, just one point before we go on. Women have higher HDL than men. These are, this is across puberty. HDL rises in childhood and is constant in puberty in girls. HDL rises in childhood and falls with the presence of testosterone in young boys. So the reason why HDL is higher in girls than boys or women than men is because they've got higher testosterone, like the anabolic steroids. So um, this is a woman with ethanol abuse. She's got a high cholesterol, um, high HDL. The ratio is not too bad. Um, she's got alcoholism, and, um, and that's the reason why she had such high cholesterol. This is a patient with um, very low, uh, very high HDL, um, and uh, they, well, they had primary biliary cirrhosis, positive, um, yeah, positive um, anti-mitochondrial antibodies. I'm not sure why they didn't come up. Okay, so in summary, um, a standard lipid profile provides a good impression of what is happening to the lipoproteins in the body. You don't have to measure the lipoproteins, except for LP little a, um, to understand what is happening in that person's body. For cardiovascular disease, the emphasis should be placed on the parameters that predict small dense LDL. Non-HDL, if you like, it's far better than LDL and triglyceride and so on, but my favorite is total cholesterol HDL ratio. And further testing may be required to understand the patient. So you may need to do LP little a. There's a strong family history which is not explained by the lipid profile. You may need to do A1C if there's a high trig and you've underestimated how insulin resistant that patient is. You may need to do TFT if the cholesterol is very high or very low. Um, and, thyroid, and liver function tests for alcoholism and primary biliary cirrhosis. Now, I'll leave you with a bonus case. Uh, this is a patient who's very well known to me. I've been looking after him, well, since birth, really. And uh, in 1989, um, when he started chemical pathology training, his profile wasn't too good. Cholesterol of 6, HDL of 1.1. The ratio is 5.5. That's way above 4.5. We didn't know about the ratio back then, though, so I, I went on happily, not worrying about it. But in, in 2009, when we knew about the ratio and things had got a bit worse, cholesterol 6.5, 6.4, HDL falling, my ratio is disastrous. And so um, this is why I got involved in that sort of community. So I went, I went on to a high-fat diet, and this is what it did. It... Um, Remember, high-fat diets, drop your triglyceride. Um, fortunately, it didn't increase my cholesterol, even though I was expecting it to rise. And um, it did increase my LDL slightly. Look what it did to the HDL. There's no drug that can do that. And then the ratio fell. And at HDL ratio of 3.6, you would predict there's no small dense HDL. LDL, and there was no small dense LDL in, in my blood. So I do put uh, my money where my mouth is, um, literally. And so I actually um, do believe that we'd need to learn a lot more about diets and how we can influence the, the lipid levels in our blood and what they tell us about the pathology that might be occurring in our body. So that's uh, the end of the talk. I think I've left 10 minutes for question time. Um, I hope I get some. Thanks. Perlene, are you there? Yes, hi. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and uh, all the different cases with the, um, it was very informative. Uh, very intriguing about the high fat versus high carb diet. Yes, it's, it's really hard to turn it around because, you know, the, 
we've been told that fat is so harmful and you know we you know replaced it with you know grinding up saf sunflower seeds to make oil and you know, like mm. how natural is that mm. but um but really it's it there was a truth in it high mm. fat diets increase your cholesterol and ldl that's true so we and have a yeah Oh yeah, we have a, a, a follow-on question about oh, what that. What fat did I take? <laughs> yeah, what fat did you see? Yeah, exactly look, what I'll kind of fat you. would you recommend? I'll shock you and you'll see this. Look, I've told you about my YouTube and you'll see a whole lot of stuff on that website. So typically, um, and there are risks in this diet as well, I should say. So in my breakfast, which is Greek yogurt, not surprisingly, because you Greek yogurt is 10% saturated fat. Um, but that's not fatty enough for me. So I add uh, cream or double cream to it and some almonds, which have very low um, carb. That's at breakfast. If I'm not having um, bacon and eggs, which is another fatty meal, um, I, you know, eggs are great. They've got saturated fat and protein, no carbs, uh, cheese. Um, uh, for dinner, you know, meat, um, leaving the fat on. And salads and vegetables, they're okay. They don't contain much um, starch. Um, yeah, so uh, all of that, yeah, my diet was quite fatty. But that, you know, to a degree, that extreme diet, which is also called a keto diet, you don't need to have. Um, you, you probably need to do it if you want to reverse your diabetes or reverse your cardiovascular disease. But once you've reached your clinical goal, you can go back to a balanced diet. Okay, so um, Sam's got a question about palm oil and coconut oil. Um, they're not, the thing about them is that they, they are found, polyunsaturated fats are found to be um, protective. A little bit of polyunsaturated fats are found to be protective. But um, I think to a degree, uh, they're sort of an antidote for the lack of saturated fat though, uh, the omega-6 and so on. So I don't, personally, I think coconut oil is something the low carb community love. It's a, it's a monounsaturate, so it's, hard, it's close to a saturated fat, a monounsaturated fat. And so I don't mind that. Palm oil, I'm not a great fan of. Um, I think it's an unnatural oil to be eating. Um, I go on with the other questions. Do cholesterols, oh God, uh, <laughs> I'm not a SARS expert. Um, that, but that is an incredibly insightful question, Benali, because, um, you know, we know that viruses get access to the liver through the LDL particle. And we think it's one of the reasons why PCSK9 exists to identify um, damaging LDL particles and incinerate them with the receptor. So yes, LDL plays a role in infection and inflammation. I don't know specifically what it, whether it plays a role in, in SARS, but yes, LDL has other roles. Um, hyperlipidemic patient, which cooking oil. So uh, olive oil, sort of a you know, a, a, you know, low saturated oil, and we know the Mediterranean's light. So I only use olive oil, but um, coconut oil is okay as well. But it's not quite as tasty. Um, um, canola, canola oil again. I worry about it because it's such an unnatural oil for people for humans to be eating. Um, yeah, olive oil. Uh, yeah, it depends on the olive oil. You can, get, um, yeah, you can get sort of peroxidized from forming and so on. But you're not supposed to burn the oil. You're supposed to have the right temperature. Um, anyway, it's better probably to cook the meat and put the fresh olive oil on it rather than cooking it in the olive oil. <laughs> anyway, I've got. An, uh, I didn't expect the discussion to go into so many dietary questions. Um, um, I, I have a question more on the uh, uh, um, measurement then. I, I have, uh, you know, uh, what, what do you think about direct LDL tests versus, you know, calculations of, of LDL? Yeah, the... look, we're just getting used to, Roche has got a new uh, direct test, and I think others do have it as well. Um, 
the um, we're running we're running a few patients between the uh, gradient gel electrophoresis and the um, direct LDL, and and generally they correlate. So I think it's a poor man's gradient gel electro. The gradient gel electrophoresis costs over a hundred Australian dollars, and I'm pretty sure the direct LDL test is cheaper than that. Um, so it's yeah, but re remembering the total cholesterol HDL ratio tells you 80% of the time what's going on. So it's only when you've got a borderline total cholesterol HDL ratio, let's say 4.5 is the cutoff, between 4 and 5, the total cholesterol HDL ratio, then you need some sort of other me you know, guide to whether this patient's got small dense LDL. And I ideally, if you had the money, I'd do the gradient gel electrophoresis, and there are other forms, NMR and so on in other countries, or the direct LDL, I think, is a, is a, is a good method. They do work, as much as the HDL method, direct HDL methods work. Uh, Sam had a very good question about non-fasting tests. Um, the neat thing about the total cholesterol ratio ratio is that fasting doesn't affect total cholesterol and HDL. Um, having a meal, believe it or not, drops slightly your total cholesterol and HDL. Meals just increase triglyceride, typically by about 0.2 or 0.3. So it's a very marginal increase in triglyceride. If you're diabetic and you've had a recent big fat meal, yes, it'll increase by a lot more. But but the you know the neat thing about um, non-fasting tests, other than not having to fast, is that they don't affect total cholesterol and HDL. So that indicator of total cholesterol HDL ratio or total cholesterol minus HDL is not affected. And the impact of the diet of slightly dropping the total cholesterol and HDL cancels itself out. So, so I do agree that you do not need to fast for the typical lipid profile unless you're deeply interested in the triglyceride level, in which case ideally you should fast. Might be all, Elaine, on good um, timing. On. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, maybe just one more comment on the, the direct test versus uh, calculations. Yeah. And, like once or twice, we have some patients where, you know, when we look at our direct test, it's, uh, it doesn't match with the total cholesterol number. Uh, like maybe if we add, you know, HDL and LDL is already pretty much equals total cholesterol or something. Would that, you know, what, what would you advise yeah, for such okay. cases? Okay, another, yes, very good. Um, it would be another talk, but the Friedwald calculation is imperfect and there are a whole lot of new calculations. Um, the um, Samson Hopkins um, uh, and the, um, the Serbian equation. Um, th and those equations predict um, HDL at low levels. Friedwald never had LDL levels of two below 2.6. The formula doesn't work down there. And so either if the H if the LDL is calculating below 2.6 and it's unreliable because of the nature of the Friedwald equation, particularly when trigs are high, um, then it would be better to do a direct LDL or to use the Samson equation supposed to be able to extend out to trigs of eight. But um, yes, there is a place for the direct LDL when the Friedwald equation is unreliable. Um, there's a good uh, question about the fasting period. I might sneak that one in. Um, we say uh, the ideal fasting period is 10 to 12 hours, but we accept samples between 8 to 15 hours. You have to fast for longer than 8 hours because chylomicrons can still be there after up to eight hours, particularly in diabetic patients with insulin resistance, which slows the clearance of chylomicrons. And conversely, why not beyond 15 hours? Because um, the stress that occurs with fasting, you know, it not only leads to gluconeogenic but genesis, but it also changes lipoprotein metabolism as well. So beyond 15 hours, things are not reliable. So, so but generally eight to 15 hours is... Um, is acceptable, ideally 10 to 12 hours. Um, I'm not really sure about oils and how many times you can use them. 
you can tell if they're burning, they, you shouldn't be using them, but that's about all I can say. <laughs> all right. Okay, great. So, um, so we're at five o'clock, so thank you very much. I think I, you know, share the opinion of many of our viewers to say, you know, it was an excellent talk, uh, Professor, and, and, you know, we, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise. My pleasure.